I want to ask if you will stand with us here just for the reading of the word. There's actually two scriptures, and one is found in St. John chapter 3, and the other one is found in Romans chapter 5. And Romans chapter 5, we'll only read well, we'll read perhaps the first 11 verses. After we read John 3, 16 and 17. So follow with us if you will. Let's read responsibly, beginning at verse 16 in St. John chapter 3. The word of God says, For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son, that whosoever believeth in him should not perish, but have everlasting life. Together. For God, For God sent not, not his Son into, into the, the world, world to, to condemn, condemn the world, but that, that the, the world, world through him, him might be saved. Now, if you will turn to Romans chapter 5, uh, beginning at verse 1, uh, I'll read a verse and, and, and you will read responsibly, if you will. Therefore, being justified by faith, we have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ. By whom also we have access by faith into this grace wherein we stand and rejoice in hope of the glory of God. And not only so, but we glory in tribulations also, knowing that tribulation worketh patience. And patience experience, and experience hope. And hope maketh not ashamed, because the love of God is shed abroad in our hearts by the Holy Ghost which is given to us. For when we were yet without strength, in due time Christ died for the ungodly. For scarcely for a righteous man will one die. Yet perhaps for a good man, some would even dare to die. But God commended his love toward us in that while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. Much more than being now justified by his blood, we shall be saved from wrath through him. For if when we were enemies, we were reconciled to God by the death of his son, much more being reconciled, we shall be saved by his life. And together the last verse. And, and not, not only, only so, so, but, but we, we also joy in, in God through our Lord, Lord Jesus Christ, Christ, by whom we, we have, have now received the atonement. the atonement. Praise the Lord. Pray with me. Heavenly Father, thank you for that which you've done through your son. We are eternally grateful. If it had not been for the Lord, on our side, where would we be? We thank you. We bless you now. Let your word come alive today. Quicken, illuminate it. Illuminate our minds, so oh God, that we may perceive and grasp what you are saying to us today by your precious love. In Jesus' name we pray. And now, Lord, take charge of the atmosphere. Now, bless, O oh God. And then let the power of God be wonderful and the love be felt. Fill this atmosphere with your gracious love. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. God bless you. You may be seated. We've been on the theme of God's love. God um, spoke to me some few weeks ago and said, begin to preach on themes, began to, I won't say exhaust, but at least preach for a while the themes, and uh, it helps us, it gives us more insight, more understanding, more wisdom, more knowledge of what God has in mind, so we've been talking about God's love for his people, God's love. We're in a day and time where there's a lot going on and there's the tendency to question God's love. 
And uh, you don't have to look very far to see what's going on in our world. It makes a lot of people wonder, what is the end going to be? Where is God in all this? What's happening? Is the world about to come to an end? Is it about to self-destruct? So many questions are going through people's mind now. But God remains the same. The Bible says he's the same yesterday and today and forever. Aren't you glad that you can put your faith in someone that is unchangeable? In light of all the things that are taking place, all the changes that are taking place in the political arena, all the changes that are taking place, but there is someone that is so trustworthy and reliable, steadfast and stable, fixed and unmovable. God. Society says there are no absolutes, but there is. God is. Hallelujah. And his truth endures, the Bible says, throughout all generations. There are some absolutes. God is absolutely true, real. So we want to talk briefly about this love in light of all of these things here. The church, if nobody else knows, the church must know that God loves. You don't expect the world to know because the world is not in touch with God, but the church, the body of Christ, those whose eyes have been opened should know that God loves the world. Isn't that right? Now look at St. John chapter 3. The Bible says in verse 16, For God so loved. He didn't just love. He so loved. That kind of love will move you into action. Love the world that he gave his only begotten son that whosoever believed in him should not perish but have everlasting life. God sent not his son into the world to condemn the world, but that the world through him might be saved. Somebody say a savior. savior. That's who he is. God sent a deliverer. God sent a savior. God sent a rescuer. To rescue us from our sins. He, he sent someone to deliver us. We were like uh, the, the, the man that was in the ocean or in the water drowning and had gone down for, going down for his third time. And God reached out his hands to save us. And so we are grateful. There's a couple of things I want to point out that the Lord pointed out to me and I hope it will be a blessing to you today concerning this passage. Verse 16 says, For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son that whosoever believes in him should not perish but have everlasting life. He gave his only begotten son. And what the Lord revealed to me is that a person's love can be measured by his willingness to sacrifice for another. So if we can better grasp the depth of the sacrifice that God did to rescue us and to help us, it helps us to understand that he loves us. So when we face trials, we don't have to begin to wonder, does God love me? His actions makes it clear of his love. Is that right? The Lord Jesus said it like this. Greater love hath no man than this. That a man would lay down his life for his friends. And that's what Jesus did for us. He gave 
his only begotten son. It's one thing if he had a, a lot of children, but he had one. You, you, you know how precious when somebody only have one child, that child becomes. They guard it with their lives and anything goes wrong, uh, you know, you'll hear from the parents in a hurry, but God was willing. to die, sent his son to die for us. Woo. A person's love can be measured by his willingness to sacrifice for another. We can't find a greater love. Does God love us? Hallelujah. The second thing he pointed out is found in verse 17. For God sent not his son into the world to condemn the world, but that the world through him might be saved. Most people, if, if they just knew this, for God sent not his son into the world to condemn the world. Now, 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 sometimes we preachers, we, we are at fault when we don't understand that. God sent his son as a rescuer. That's his nature. He said, I didn't come to conclude and say the world is not worthy. The world is trifling. I, I, I can't deal with them. He, he, he didn't send his son to do that. Uh, and I, as, as we say, uh, he didn't look at the world as they're not about nothing. He sent his son as a rescuer, as a savior. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Now, this is what the Lord made just open up to me as I was looking at this portion. He did not send his son to condemn the world, to render unfit. And this is how he said it to me. He said, he did not give us what we deserved, but he gave us what we needed. We deserved punishment, but we needed a savior. Are you hearing what I'm saying? So God said, the Holy Spirit said, he did not give us what we deserved, but what we needed. We deserved eternal separation from God, but he came as a savior. He came to heal and to deliver us. We were wounded and broken and battered we, we we deserved whatever the consequences of sin was to bring we deserved the judgment hand of God but the Lord says to me he did not give us what we deserved but he gave us what we needed that's love that's the nature of God's love. God so loved the world. He, 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 he was not settled and satisfied with the condition of the world. He so loved. He, he, he knew that humanity would end up being self-destructive if he didn't do anything. But God, but God so loved the world that he gave his only son. He became what the Bible points in Genesis, the ark. You remember the story of the flood, amen? God had no to build an ark. Well, the ark was a type of Jesus Christ. Anyone that got in the ark, right? When the 40 days of rain would come, they would be saved from the rain, right? The ark was a type of Jesus Christ. All right, let me slow down a little bit here. He gave, the Bible says he did not send his son to condemn the world. I want you to get that. God is not a condemner. 
in our families, in our homes, on our job, on the walk in the marketplace. God's not a condemner. He's a rescuer. He came to give life. The thief comes. The thief comes, the devil. Only to steal, kill, and destroy. So if they're stealing and killing and destroying, it didn't come from God. Jesus said, but I am come that they might have life and that they might have it more abundantly. Can I say something to you today, saints? God does not want you just to get by. came that you might have life to the full. He doesn't want you to just set foot in the kingdom and struggle. He wants you to have a, an abundance of joy, an abundance of peace, an abundance of life, an abundance of good health. God is a rescuer. He's a good savior. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Glory to God. He's a good savior. And as I look in Romans chapter 5, therefore being justified by faith, we have peace with God. Now this is important here because uh, if there's no peace, there's, 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 there's hostility in our relationship with God. It, it, you hear what I'm saying? I don't know how God may feel about me uh, because uh, I'm not in right terms with him. But he said, therefore being uh, declared righteous or justified by faith, we have peace with our God through our Lord Jesus Christ. That means there's no hostility between me and God and you and God. And somebody said, now, now listen, if there's, there, if there's guilt and condemnation in our relationship with, between us and God as Christians, now listen, that means that we have a twisted or distorted image of who God is and what he's done. Are you with me? Because the word here says, since we have been justified, which means to be declared as righteous, we have peace with God. Now, now this, let me show you what, what the Lord shared with me about this. He says that that's something that would not be possible if we were justified by works. If I'm justified by works, I can't have peace very long. I can only have it as long as I feel like I'm doing good. Anybody hear what I'm saying? But when I'm justified by faith in what Christ has already done, I can have peace even if I miss the mark sometime because it's not predicated upon how good I am or how much good I have done, but it's predicated upon the word of God that says by faith, we believe in the redemptive plan of God for God rescued us out of darkness into his marvelous light and that's what we hang our faith on. And not how good we can be. I remember for a long time that seemed to be a hard thing for me to I would get so excited about God and every time I'd blow it, my joy and my peace went down because I was trusting in my own self. I was trusting in my own ability to be righteous. But if I trust in my own ability to be righteous, there's no need for Jesus. Are you hearing what I'm saying? He did what no man could do. God in Romans 3, Paul began in his theology declaring and showing that the entire world was 
guilty before the judgment bar of God. So if you read Romans 3, you see how God had concluded the philosophers, the Jews, the Gentiles, and everybody else. He showed where they were all sinners and subject to the hand of God's wrath, standing before a holy God. And he stamped the gavel and said, in Romans 3, he said, now, we know, let me read it for you. Romans 3, he says, verse 20, 19. Now we know that what things whoever the law says, it said to them who are under the law, that every mouth may be stopped and all the world may become guilty before God. So Paul paints this picture here and he brings every person in the universe subject to the throne and the bar of God and God Waiting, we're waiting for the verdict. It's a grim picture, but it didn't stop there. Look at what he said. Verse 20 says, therefore by the deeds of the law, there shall no flesh, no human being be justified in God's sight. Because by the law is the knowledge of sin. But now, somebody say but now. The righteousness of God apart from the law is manifested, witnessed by the law and the prophets, even the righteousness of God, which is by faith of Jesus Christ to all and upon all them that what? That believe there is no difference because all have sinned and come short of the glory of God. So now he says being declared righteous freely without any cost. By his grace. Somebody say grace. It is grace that we must look to. The grace of God. It is grace that brought us out of darkness. It is grace that will sustain us. It is the grace that would get us to heaven. It is the grace of God. It is by grace you are saved, Paul said, not of works. Lest anybody would turn around and boast. Now, if, 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 if I... If I feel like I in my own strength can serve the Lord and be right all the time and guess what it's going to do for me? It's going to make me look down on you if you can't do it. You've you, you, you got to hear what I'm saying. If I am righteous in my own self, then God's not going to get the glory. You remember the old Pharisee uh, in, in, in Luke chapter, uh, I think it's Luke chapter uh, 8, I believe it is, or 18. The Pharisee, he comes into the temple, he's going to pray, but he's righteous in his own eyes. So he comes into the temple there and then there's an old publican, a tax collector there, he, he's there too. So the Pharisee looks he says, God, I thank you that I'm not like that, that old tax collector. I fast twice a week. I give alms. I give my tithes. In short, God, you ought to be happy to have me. <laughs> there he was coming to be justified but he was righteous in his own eyes here are the old publicans there the one he looked down on he didn't feel worthy to even come close to the altar but he stood afar off he didn't feel worthy he didn't feel like he had nothing to offer and so he stood afar off and he said God be merciful to me, a sinner. And the Bible says, Jesus said, God, he said, that man went down to his household justified, declared righteous before God because it was not in himself that he was good. And he understood that. And I 
can say this to you that when we're in Christ, I don't care how many accomplishments we accomplish. I don't care how much we pray and fast. I don't care how much we uh, uh, do the things that God is asking us to do. All of that's good, but it's not dependent upon how good we can be. One man, Adam, sinned and brought sin on the entire universe. But thanks be to God, one man, Jesus Christ, was the only one qualified to die. Hallelujah. So when he died for the sins of humanity, every born person that lives in this world can be saved if they believe in the gospel message of our Lord Jesus Christ. Hallelujah. For God sent not his son into the world to condemn the world, but that the world through him might be saved. Hallelujah, somebody. Glory to God. That's love. That's love can have peace with God but we must know that it's not based on works if you're not performing well trust God to give you the strength to do right isn't that right that grace will give you the strength to live a godly life. It is God's grace. It is God's grace. So many Christians in this day and time now really don't understand. And many of them are so discouraged trying to serve God and trying to live a godly life because they don't understand that it takes God's grace and his divine power to empower them to live for him. Hallelujah. 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 That way he gets the glory, isn't that right? If I can do it on, apart from Jesus, ain't no need of me fooling myself. He's not gonna get the true glory. I may say it in my mouth, but in deep inside, I'm feeling like, uh-uh, I did this thing. Man looks on the outward, but God looks where? God knows what's in the heart. Isn't that right? Hallelujah. When I'm dependent on God, that's all he wants. That's all he wants. Hallelujah. It may seem hard, but when you come to God in faith, God can do exceeding abundantly above all that we could ever ask or think. Hallelujah. If you can think it, he can do more than that. Hallelujah. If you could ask it, he can do more than that. I don't care what the situation is. Hallelujah. God is able. God can give you strength like you've never known before. God can heal your soul. God can heal your mind. God can heal your body. God can heal the irregular thought patterns in your life. God can do anything for those that will believe. Hallelujah. Even in the Old Testament, it was like this. Uh, God says, Any, is anything too hard for God? Wait, wait, wait. It was like, wait, 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 but you know who you're dealing with? He said, is there anything too hard for God? I mean, you're not dealing with mortal man. You're dealing with the almighty God. Hallelujah. Is anything too hard for God? Ah, my God, my God. I'm so happy to be serving someone that can do anything. Hallelujah. Glory to God. Hallelujah. But the just shall live by faith. I got to believe this thing. Isn't that right? I can't be saying I believe it and I'm talking like I don't believe a word of it. Now, there's an inconsistency. Look at somebody saying, now, there can't be no inconsistencies now. If you're going to believe this thing, then you got to believe it. Isn't that right? Hallelujah. Glory to God. You believe God's a healer, then don't contradict it and begin to say, I'm never going to be healed. I'm going to be this, this way the rest of my life. No, 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 no. Either believe it. Yeah. Let that word, that confession line up with what that heart's supposed to believe. Isn't that right? 
Oh, he can do his job now. He can do his job. He's a mighty warrior. Ah, he's exciting to me. Hallelujah. I love Jesus because he's so faithful. He's so good. So he says, being justified by faith, we have peace with God. You can have peace. I, we must, we should have peace on a regular basis. Why? Because our faith is not in ourselves. It is in God. As long as my faith is intact, you stump your toe and you say, God, I'm so sorry to stump my toe. Give me the strength to overcome this year. Get right up and do it again. Go and walk with God. Isn't that right? Hallelujah. The race is not given to the swift. The battle is not given to the one that's strong in themselves. Hallelujah. But this is an endurance race. Hallelujah. God said, he that shall endure to the end. It's a faith thing. Isn't that right? Hallelujah. Don't lose heart. Don't give up. Uh, whatever you do, the situations may get tough sometimes. Circumstances may be deplorable. But I want you to know that there is a God in heaven that sits high, but he looks low. He looks and sees what's going on. I heard, I remember he was bringing back to me just recently. That some person may say, well, God's too busy. You know, this is, this is a twisted image of God. God's too busy. He's not concerned about my little life, my little situation. God got several billion people to deal with, so he's not concerned about me. Wrong. The Bible says the spirit of man is the candle of the Lord. How does God keep up with me? He put his spirit in me. How does he keep up with the universe? He put his spirit in us. And he sees and he knows everything that's going on. My God, he's a good God. He's a wonderful savior. Hallelujah. If you're struggling, if you're going through, if you feel discouraged, he sees it, he knows it. It comes right up before God because your spirit, hallelujah, is the candle of the Lord. Hallelujah. God loves us today. He cares for us. And you can put your trust in him. Thank you, Lord. The other thing that I want to point out here is concerning God's God. Is he says, he points out that in Romans 3, 3, through, 3 and 4, Paul was really making clear that the, um, we in our own selves, there's our righteousness. And dealing basically with the righteousness that was... Uh, of the law of Moses here. That's basically what he was dealing with in that passage here. And, but, uh, and so the Jews, to them, it meant more than it would mean to us because we were not under the law of Moses. But what means a lot to us is when we're trying to earn God's mercy and, his, and trying to merit that favor, trying to be good enough. That's what we can relate to. We're not Jews, but we can relate to trying to trying to please God of ourselves. So and so it means something very similar. But what he was saying and in, 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 in making clear that there is an apart from law righteousness. Because of what the law was designed to do, the law was only designed to amplify sin. It had no power to make a person righteous. It wasn't designed for that. And so when we come to grace, after God shows that the whole world is guilty, the Jews and everybody else, then he presents this righteousness of God. It's different. It's through Christ now. And he, in the Old Testament, he was demanding righteousness. In the New Testament, he's imparting righteousness. He's giving it. Hallelujah. Glory to God. And that's the difference, you see. And uh, so, all right. Now, let me go on here. I'm hasten to conclusion here. Uh, the, but what he, what he pointed out, what he was pointing out is that Jesus took God's judgment for our sins. This is simple. It's elementary, but it's really, really important to the basic foundation of our faith. Jesus took God's judgment for my sins. He bore it for me. He declared me innocent of all charges. So if I am feeling guilty as a Christian, it's just that I don't 
understand what God has done. He took my sins. And the Bible says he will cast them into the sea of forgiveness never to remember them anymore. Now if God will no longer remember my sins, why am I rehearsing those things? Why would I rehearse what God has washed it away into the sea of forgetfulness, never to remember them anymore? I want to pause and let's give some glory to God right now. Hallelujah. Glory to God. Hallelujah. Glory to God. Hallelujah. Glory to God. Glory. Hallelujah. Thank you for your mercy, Lord. Thank you for your goodness. Hallelujah. Thank you. Thank you for taking God's judgment. That which was what I deserved. But you didn't give me what I deserved. You gave me what I needed. And for this, I am eternally grateful. Hallelujah. What about you today? Hallelujah. Glory to God. Now, one last thing here. I want to share with you briefly what the Holy Spirit gave to me to share with us today and, and, and those that are on by way of watching me and listening by way of television. God said the part of the problem, the big problem, lie in distorted images of God. What do you mean? So if God has done all that for us, there's still no joy. If God has done all that, we're sick. If he's done all of that, we're not happy. The breakdown <laughs> is in the distorted images of God. I shared with them how you know, they used to have these little circuses come to town and, and they have the mirrors. You walk in that little place and those little places with all those different miracles, mirror, mirrors and you look at yourself. You look fat. You look elongated. You look warped, right? What well, God says, his people have distorted images of who he is. And therein lies the problem. Well, you say, well, what in the world can I do about that? Be not conformed, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind. Ah, glory to God. Hallelujah. Have you ever wondered why God told Joshua, Joshua, be strong. This book of the law shall not depart out of your mouth, but you shall meditate on it day and night. Then you'll make your way prosperous. Then you'll have good success. Have you ever wondered why the psalmist said, blessed is the man that walked not in the counsel of the ungodly, nor stand in the way of sinners, nor sit in the seat of the scornful, but his delight is in the law of the Lord. And in his law does he meditate day and night. And the Bible says, and he shall be like a tree planted by the rivers of water that brings forth his fruit in his season. His leaf also shall not wither and dry up and whatsoever he do shall prosper. James said, be ye doers of the word and not hearers only. Isn't that right? 
Whoever looks into the perfect law of freedom, this is what James said, and, and continue looking, continue looking at this law, he being not a forgetful hearer, but a doer of the word, this man shall be blessed in his deeds. The problem then is not looking long enough into the word of freedom. Jesus said, if you continue in my word, then are you my disciples indeed, and you will know the truth, and the truth shall make you free. There's freedom for you and I. Somebody say freedom. freedom. Hallelujah. That's what God has for you and I. Now, I'm going to wrap this up here. I want to say a couple of things about the distorted images, and then we're going to conclude. God was saying, now first of all, an image is a visual representation of something. Imagery. Images, Images are pictures and power, a powerful combination of thoughts and feelings. Long before we thought, even in our earliest years, long before we thought in words, we thought in pictures or images. These images are loaded with emotions. From the first day of life, we begin storing memories of our emotional experiences. Like a mother comes out of the room or a father comes out of the room and a little toddler there looking and for some reason he's very angry. His face is frowned or he's speaking, saying some ugly things and that little two-year-old or one-year-old looking and there's an image. That little toddler sees an image. That little toddler cannot process what they're seeing. They cannot articulate accurately. All they see is I see an angry face of a superior. Somebody that I'm supposed to gravitate toward, but I'm, I'm, I'm scared. I, 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 can't, I, can't, I don't know what to make of it. Images, somebody. Images. Are you with me? Images are formed at the earliest part of life, sometimes even utero, even in the womb, things are formed. We said therein lies the problem, right? All right, so the images are formed, and uh, so when, when, when we use the term distorted, distorted means pulled or twisted out of shape, contorted, given a misleading or false account or impression, misrepresented. And God said, let us make man in our image after our likeness. But over a period of time, man began to shape God in his own image. That's the reverse, right? Because of the things that went through, he went through. How did these things get distorted? Sometimes preachers, sometimes Sunday school teachers, Sometimes family, sometimes parents, as best they know, they can misrepresent God. I'll tell you what I'm saying. There was a, years ago, I was doing some ministering, reaching out. Got into this home. This boy was about 17. Was talking to his mom. His mom, she was saved. And she was using the word of God wrongly, trying to straighten him out. And he was a teenager being a teenager. He wasn't a bad, bad child, but he had things that he needed to work on. And every time he would attempt to do something, she would in his term, put her mouth on him. She would say, God's going to get you. And she says, you can't hide. You may hide from me, but you can't hide from God. God's going to get you. So, so, so she's putting this thing in his mind. So he tried to outlive it, and every time he would try to shake it off and outdo it, and every time he'd do something that he shouldn't do, then it would be revealed to her. And so it reinforced what she was saying. And I remember even he 
came in shortly during the time that I was there. And she said, you think you're getting away, but God's going to get you. He sees you. And he said, you put your mouth on me, man. He was so frustrated. He was so frustrated. Now, there was a better way to do that. Now, I mean, you know, it could have been, son, there are consequences when you do wrong. So you learn to do right. If you want to do well in life, learn the right way of doing things. There's so many ways that he could have, she could have done that, right? But I'm saying how sometimes images and concepts and thoughts and feelings and the, how those things are formed sometimes. So not only the church, but sometimes through family. Sometimes families are misrepresented. And so the child grows up and begins to see that God is old Scrooge. He's old. He's somebody like Sherlock Holmes. He's sitting around the corner waiting for us to do wrong. So when that person began to come to, you know, they, it's like they're, they're afraid. They don't want to come to God because God is Sherlock Holmes. He, you know, I, I can't live for God. So, you know, he's going to be out to get me the, the moment I make a mistake. But God's not like that. He's not like that. But God says it's the images that hinders us because we don't see God the way he really is. And that's why we painted the picture as to who God is. God so loved, he gave his own name. God is good. I share with you one, one time I was frustrated with the Lord because I didn't understand what was going on in my life. And I was saying some things that I should not have said. You know, y'all don't do that, but that happened to me. <laughs> so I'm, I'm kind of mouthing off at the mouth a little bit, but I, I wasn't crazy enough to be directly mouthing off at him. So I, I kind of directed, it was God directed. I'm saying stuff, but it was directed at him. Again, y'all don't do that, but I'm trying to share what, what, what happened to me. And then the Lord said, he said, son, son I'm good. In other words, you, 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 you struggling. He said, I'm good, son. So you, you. <laughs> He's a good God. But I didn't know that. It was my personal struggles. The images that I painted that was painted from my youth on up. My father was different. He was pretty strict. That's another thing. God ain't strict. He means what he say. And he says what he mean. But he's full of mercy. He's full of grace. Are you hearing me? But my upbringing, it was strictness. So when I got saved, the images, I just felt God's a strict God. Because I was looking through lens that had been colored. If you take a pair of shades that's blue tinted lens and you put those shades on, everything you see is going to have a tint. Are you hearing what I'm saying? That's the way it is when images are distorted. We see through tinted lens. We see through distorted lens. We see God in that way. I told you, and I'm bringing this to conclusion, I had a young man that was an A student in Bible school. Made all A's one day and started to ask him, how do you see God? He said, God's an old Scrooge. But you just made an A. You got the theology right intellectually, but in your heart, God's an old Scrooge. And God says, that's where the breakdown is. Well, what's the answer, Brother Harry? God said, get in my word. Find out who I really am. I am everything that the word says about me. Get in it. Let's live in it a little bit, you know. Is that all right? Let's live in the word a little bit. Get, get, get a habit of reading two or three times a week. Get there and, and have your study habit a couple of hours at the time sitting down. You know, just, just work it out where you can have time, just you and the Lord studying, looking into his word. To find out who he really is. It will pray.
prosper you. Weeks and months down the road, things will begin to change for you like you've never seen before. Your attitude will change. A lot of things that bother you now, they wouldn't bother you anymore because life is coming through his word. Life is coming through his word. God's not that old Scrooge. God's not the God who abandons you. God's not that unreliable God. Are you hearing me? Somebody say, well, that was my dad, but that's not God, right? God's reliable. Is that enough, y'all? I'm going to pause right there. Okay. Hallelujah. <laughs> Just a few of those things God put upon my heart. You see, and a part of the answer is this. There's healing for us. God heals our wounded hearts. He heals those memories. He heals those damaged emotions. He heals the wounded will. Oh my God, I tell you, saints, if I could paint this picture any better, I would. God is a healer. Oh my God, I was riding down the road some short brief time ago. God began to bring a memory that I needed to be healed. I didn't know. I didn't know. And he brought it up. And being in healing and understanding that portion, I knew that it was something that God wanted to heal me. I was riding in the car, my wife and Jessica. So I felt it coming on. I said, oh, I believe you want to take me somewhere. So, you know, men, we, we kind of, we don't, we don't like breaking down. Now, that, that, just, that, that ain't something we like to do. So I'm riding, I'm driving, so I felt it coming on. And I kind of looked over there to see if she was looking. <laughs> Tears were forming in my eyes. And I knew God was talking to me. I knew he, he wanted to, 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 to go there deeply where that hurt was. And, and I was fighting it. I was just trying to keep it, you know, I just got to keep it together here because this thing going to make me break down if I open up. So I said, like, God, not now. But he didn't let up. He seemed to be going more. So I looked over there again and see my wife was looking. By this time, tears were coming, you know, coming down my eyes. But God is so loving. Oh, it felt so good. God is good. He, he goes to the hurt. He goes to the unhealed memories there that need healing. So he was taking me back something that happened 10 years ago that, that, that hadn't been properly dealt with, that was still causing some problems in my emotion. You, you got to hear what I'm trying to tell you. Ah, Jesus. So I had to make a decision. Am I going to let him do it now? Am I going to Push him back. But <laughs> knowing what I know, I wasn't going to push him back. I said, okay, this has just got it. just got to happen, okay. So I'm boohooing there behind the steering wheel. And see, I got a good wife, so she, she, can, she can sense it. She ain't going to say nothing. She'll just, you know, she's got a nice little way. She'll reach a little hand over there and touch me, you know, just like, yeah, I feel you. I know where you're at. I thank God for my wife. <laughs> Hallelujah. The tears begin to flow. God began to heal those areas where I needed healing. And sometimes anger can go for so long. So long. It can even get buried. Bear it really, really low. And, and every now and then, God may, if he want to let you know it's still there, then something will happen. Somebody just sets you off. And man, you, it's like you, you, you're so mad and you hurt. It's like the Lord said, I just want you to know it's there. But I can handle that if you let me. That's what he says. I can handle that if you let me. Come on, let's give God some praise. Hallelujah. Glory to God. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Glory to God. There's not a friend like the lowly Jesus. 
No, not one. The song says, none that can heal my soul's diseases. No, not one. Jesus knows all about our struggles. And he will supply till the day is done. There's not a friend like the lowly Jesus. No, not one. He can transcend time. He can go back 20, 30, 40, 50 years in your life and in a memory that you had no idea. In conclusion, I want you to stand, but I want to share this with you. I was preaching years ago at a place and as I preached on healing, God said, there's a man here that's longing for his dad. And I said, God want to heal you. And so I thought it was a young man. I said, come sir, whoever you are, if you feel that witness in your heart. Out came a man, he was older than I am now, weeping and sobbing like a baby. We don't outgrow it, saints. There's some hurts, we don't outgrow. They just stay there, shaping our behaviors, causing hypertension, doing their damage in our physical body. But the Savior have come to give us life. Life to the full. He's the Savior. He didn't come to condemn us. He came to save. He came to heal us and to make life better for us. What about you today? Father, I thank you. I give you praise and I give you glory. I thank you so much for the great love that you have for humanity. I thank you because there's no one who cares for our soul like you. The psalmist says, the songwriter says, I was lost in a
that man, that woman. Humans. That soul that cries out to you now, Lord. That's secretly carrying the pain. Feeling like no one cares. Feeling like there is no hope. Once again, you may be seated. Thank God. 